in the house of the Lord. Amen. Uh, no better place to be on a Sunday morning to be in God's house to come and fellowship with each other, to love on each other and cry on each other and pray with each other. That's what church family's about, ain't it? And I just thank the Lord for this church and the love of this church. You don't know, even going outside uh, this county, how I hear many times, hey, where you go to church at, Emmanuel Baptist Church? You know, that's a loving church. I really like that church. And I always ask them, well, are you in church? <laughs> if you ain't, then come and see us then. So then I just thank the Lord for that. I appreciate each and every one being here. If you are visiting us this morning, please feel free to fill out a visitor's card if you feel led to at the Welcome Center. They'll have a little gift for you back there and love to call and talk to you a little bit about the church. And if you got any questions, uh, feel free to always call me uh, concerning anything that's going on at the church or got any questions about us here at Emmanuel Baptist Church. With that said, we're going to have a word of prayer at this time. Father, we do thank you once again for just another opportunity that we can come back to your house today, Lord, that, Lord, that we can come, Lord, as we look around and see on the news and in the papers, Lord, of so much persecution going on around the world, Father, to Christians, Father, that you've allowed us to live in a country, the greatest country in the world, Father, that, uh, Lord, that we can come and worship you here and provide a place, Lord, that we don't have the persecution that we see all around this world, Father, it's all by you, Lord, by your divine grace and mercy, Father. Lord, I pray today, Lord, during these services, Father, that you get all the honor and glory for everything that's done, Lord. The songs that's sung, Lord, the special music that's sung, the message to be brought this morning, Father, we just want to give you praise and glory for it all, Lord. And above all, Lord, if there's one here today, Father, that the sweet Holy Spirit's dealing with, whatever it may be in their life, Lord, whether they hadn't received you as their personal Savior. Maybe they've been out of church and backslidden. Maybe they have a problem that's going on in their life, Father. I'm just so thankful today that we serve a Heavenly Father, that no problem's too big for our Heavenly Father. Lord, I pray once again, Lord, that you get honor and glory for it all, Lord. We give you praise and glory, and we ask it all in Jesus' holy and precious name. And all of God's children said, people of these United States need the Lord. Amen. And we all need the Lord until we realize that, until this country realize that, we're on a downhill slope. That's on right. a downhill slope. It's only through Him. Amen? Amen. Amen? All right. If you got your bulletins very quickly, if you would, look at those. We've got a lot of things happening and going on. Uh, upcoming events, if you would, just remember we got spring cleaning day tomorrow at 9 a.m. here at the church, so remember that for all those who going to participate in that to come out and be here in the morning at 9 a.m. Also, there's a potter's hand meeting at 9 a.m. March the 19th, so remember that. And then, of course, our special singing uh, this month will be the 27th, as we have the Pine Ridge Boys, and that'll be at 6 o'clock. And, of course, continue to have your calendars marked for April 30th and the blood drive in, in memory of Chase, so remember that. Also, there'll be a business meeting Wednesday uh, night, the 16th, after service. So please be here for that, if all possible. And then, of course, tonight we'll be having after service our March birthdays. We'll be having ice cream and cake for all those March birthdays this month in the Fellowship Hall after service tonight. And then also, after a regular offering this morning, I'll share just a little bit about that in just a few minutes. We'll be having a special collection to be taken up this morning for some orphans and refugees that's from Ukraine. 
and I'll share that with you there. So just uh, be in much prayer for that. And then, of course, donations are needed for the sunrise service for our breakfast on Easter Sunday. If you got any questions about that, see me or see Bubba, either one there. And then, of course, this afternoon, choir practice at 5 o'clock, choir practice at 5 o'clock, service at 6 o'clock. And then there's still some cookbooks uh, in the Welcome Center for $10 each if anyone wants a cookbook. Is there any other announcements that I may have missed? Any reminders I need? Okay. All right. With well, that said, then, the choir will sing a song at this time. If you want to use your hymn book, we also have the words posted.
I tell you what, some of y'all need to get excited, though. I've seen some in faces. You remind me of a buzzard trying to flop away instead of fly away. All right. <laughs> we got to be happy in the Lord. Amen. 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 I love you. I love you. Let us pray. Father, again, we thank you for this opportunity to be in your house. We thank you for the opportunity to be under your under shepherd, Lord, to, to hear the words this morning that are going to come from you, Lord, words that someone needs, maybe even I. We just thank you, Lord, for this. We thank you for this offering that's going to be taken up, Lord, and we ask that it be used to further your kingdom, Lord, that only you can do. We thank you. We praise you in the only name that we can, your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Most of you, I think most of you know, we're going to take up a special offering this morning for some of the Ukrainians, refugees and orphans. And I'm going to share an email that was shared with me by Brother Larry, which we took a team, he took us over there, to actually in Lithuania. And this is from Helen and Yuri, very precious family. We know personally, been with them personally, worked with them personally in the ministry, Larry more than me. But what a, it was a great opportunity to go over and see what those families, in other words, how they cherish things. I'll give you an example. They lost my luggage, and I got it like day eight of a 10-day trip. And we managed to take two of the kids, my interpreter's kids, back to the Vilnius, and they had a McDonald's there. Well, you know, they told me they didn't take any kids to McDonald's, I think it was twice a year, like at Easter and Christmas. You know, as I bought those kids those cheeseburgers and that ice cream, they shared it with each other. They looked at it and, and, and brought tears to my eyes. And I thought, man, we have kids eating Happy Meals every day here in this country and how blessed we are. I took them two, I took them two ball hats. Yes. Oh. One of the. But uh, anyway, uh, bought them ice cream, and they was looking at that and was sharing that. Bought them two ball caps, gave them two Atlanta Braves ball caps, and two of them boys wore them, I think, every time, even the church, those whole two weeks. And as we went and seen another family that was in a, like you might say, an apartment-type complex, they had two girls, they'd look at the globe there, and they would say, where'd you come from? And we would show them, and they'd say, y'all must be angels to come so far away just to see us. And Bo, you're talking about bringing tears to your eyes. And, it, and it, it reminds me of how blessed we are here. And I'm going to share this email that was sent with what's going on over there with Yuri there even in Lithuania. He sends this. We appreciate your prayer so much. My brothers, sisters, and kids are staying over in Ukraine. I can't pronounce the names there. They decided to serve in their local churches for old people and sick kids. 
My sister Ann took 10 orphans in her home basement where they're living. Yes, this is a terrible time, but in suffering, people are open to Jesus. See, he looks at it from that aspect. May God use this war to use for the salvation of many. Our church is sending vans with food to Ukraine. People are coming from Ukraine every day to Lithuania. So our church, and I presume this is the church we worked on there in Lithuania. Our church every day is like a Christian camp with you doing something for people who needs help with food, medicine, and sharing homes. God is so good. Love you, Yuri and Helen. I mean, you think about that, and you know exactly. Many times you send out money. You don't know where it's going, but I know these people. Larry knows these people. We know that this offering is going to be used for, for the further of the kingdom of God. And in this terrible situation, I think about how they're looking at it. God's going to use it in a great and mighty way. So I just wanted to share that with you this morning because many times people are skeptical about things. But I know this family. Larry knows this family. I know their ministry. I've been there. I've seen what's going on and, and, and what is happening there. So uh, just pray about it and, and see what the Lord leads you if you feel led to give this morning. If not, that's fine. Just whatever the Lord leads you to do this morning at this time. This time we have some special music. If you come at this time, Ray and Trina. Yes, I was going to make that announcement. Also, the church will be uh, sending two thousand dollars for this uh, cause too in this mission. So I was going to tell you that also.
another story one that the preacher may would read but as I'm sitting here at home drinking red wine all alone I think that Maybe that's why grace is so amazing. Staring at that empty bottle. I swear I caught a glimpse of him. He met me right there at the bottom and turned that wine to living water and taught me how. have the kids released to the children's church children's church five to seven five to seven all those kids all the kids five to seven going to children's church scott you need to stay in here son so don't go back there all right i hear you all right this time is i just Appreciate Brother Larry coming. Many of you know him. He's been coming to church here when he's available. Uh, he has a lot on his books, and I asked him if he'd come this morning, this afternoon to speak while he's here. I truly uh, love Brother Larry. He's been a great mentor to me. He's been a, a great uh, testimony to me in his life, and uh, just continue to lift him up in prayer. Continue to lift up Miss B in your prayer. She's having some difficult times now, but I appreciate him and love him, and and just uh, give Larry a welcome, if you would, this morning. Love you, Mike. God bless you. Good morning, church. Good morning. Well, my better half is not with us today. She is quite a bit under the weather. So you pray for her. Her name is easy to memorize. It's B. And if any of you... Uh, think up during the day, just lift her up in prayer. We have a lot of things physically that's going on. King David said, I have been young. Now I am old. I have not seen the righteousness forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread. Isn't it wonderful to know that as we grow older and various things set to it in these bodies as they begin to decay, that God loves us just as much as he did when we were a 15-year-old kid, could jump with our heels kicking high, God never turns his back on his children. 
God is just precious. And the two ladies who just sang voices harmonized so well. Isn't it wonderful that when you can't love yourself, God loves you? God does not give up on his kids. And I've told my grandchildren this. I told my grandkids, I said, listen, I don't care where you do, what happens in your life, you're always mine. I don't call my grandsons grandson, I call them sons. And I said, son, you always have a home here. Whatever's going on in your life, I may not agree with you, but I will not abandon you. Remember this, if you turn your back on your kids, your grandkids, who else are they going to turn to? And if you're not there to fill that void in their life, listen to me. Satan will always fill that void with some ungodly person. Be there for them. Love them. 1 John chapter 5 this morning. I'm going to speak on the subject of assurance of salvation. The gospel of John was given to us that we may know that Christ is the Lord, that Christ is the Savior. Now listen to this. 1 John is given to us that we may know that we have life and that we can have it more abundantly. One of the greatest things that I have as a teenager growing up, no one really discipled me. No one ever took me under their wings, taught me anything about scriptures. And however, I struggled as a young Christian, as a young teenager, many years. And then when I graduated from high school, I lived on my own for several years before being our few years before being I got married. And during those years, I struggled. I, I struggled with my life, and thank God he broke into my life. And I want you to know that you can have this struggle right here saying, Lord, can I really know that when I die that I'm going to heaven? Now, it's easy in a congregation like this with like people with like faith and love one another to say that. But what about in the quietness of your night and your home and your bed? What about it when you're laying there and you have had a horrible diagnosis from a doctor? Maybe you've been given only six months to live. All of a sudden, now reality begins to set in, and you really want to know, above and beyond anything else, am I going to heaven when I die? Now, some of you may not think like it, but I want to tell you something. It is the most important question that you need to know and understand. So John writes about this, and John gives us some evidences that we can know without a shadow of a doubt that we belong to the Lord. It's like taking a test, and there's five things that John addresses here, and we're going to look at in a moment. And as John addresses these, you check yourself in light of them. I want you to do something today. I don't want you to think about your grandparents or your parents or your children or your grandkids, no one else. I want you to just think today about yourself. Just draw a circle around you and think, say, God, this is for me today. Open my heart. Open my ears. Lord, do a work within my life. I'm not worried about anyone else. But Lord, remember this. I want to know for myself. Something I've learned in life. Suffering is something you do alone. When you came into this world, you were born by yourself. And when you leave this world, you will leave this world by yourself. And knowing that, you need to know by yourself, do you really know God? And are you sure that you're his child? Notice what John says in 1 John. And it's such a rich passage. There's so many, like, John is so excited about his writing that it seems like he's changing subjects from one verse, verse to another. But I want to look at this verses 11 through 13. And I found out in verses 11 through 13, he uses the word life, Zoe. Life five times. So it's evidently something very important. He's speaking about 1 John 5 and verse 11. And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life. Eternal life means it's a life that never ends. I have a hard time trying to understand eternity. I can understand a beginning and an end. There was a day that the earth was created. There will be a day when the earth comes to an end. But when I began to think about eternity, I get so lost that my mind cannot go there. And I've learned something by studying behind some great theologians is this. The human mind is incapable of understanding eternity everlasting forever and ever and ever and ever. Because everything we know has a beginning, has an end. God has no beginning. God has no end. 
and when I come in him and I have God's life living within me, it has no end. So John writes this in verse 11 and says, And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. And he, hath, and he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written to you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this passage, such assurance for us to know. It is so important, Lord, within these simple three verses here, you have told us five times that we can know that we have eternal life, and we can know that we believe on the name of the Son of God. So, Father, today I ask, Lord, you speak to my heart. Lord, I would be as a dead man standing here speaking without your unction, without your presence and power. And, Father, I ask that you would guard my lips, my heart, and my mind, that I would say nothing contrary to your will. And, Father, so today may you be glorified in all that we say and all that we do and the actions we take in hearing this message. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I love a story that was published January the 3rd, 1989. It was in the Philadelphia Inquirer by Larry Speaks. It's a story about the great physicist, Albert Einstein, who was known for his absent-mindedness. He was traveling from Princeton by train, and a conductor strolled down the aisle, punching the tickets of each passenger, and he came to Einstein. He waited for the great physicist to reach into his pocket and look for his ticket. It wasn't there. He reached into his other pocket. It wasn't there either. Einstein looked in his briefcase, but he couldn't find it. He looked in the seat behind him, and he couldn't find it. The conductor said, Dr. Einstein, I know who you are. We all know who you are. I'm sure you bought a ticket. Don't worry about it. Einstein nodded his head appreciatively, and the conductor continued down the aisle, punching the tickets. As he was ready to move to the next car, he turned around and saw the scientist down on his hands and knees looking under his seat for his ticket. The doctor came back very quickly and said, Dr. Einstein, Dr. Einstein, don't worry. I know who you are. You don't need a ticket. I'm sure you bought one. Peering up at him, Einstein said, Young man, I too know who I am. What I don't know is where I am going. The most frequently asked question to Turning Points Ministry in California is this. How can I know that when I die that I will be going to heaven? Or another way, can I know for certain that when I die I will be with the Lord? They receive hundreds and hundreds of questions every day, but this seems to be the number one question. Several years after I became a believer, I struggled with the assurance of my salvation. Maybe I was looking for a feeling, or maybe I was looking for some kind of emotional experience to give me the assurance of my salvation. I remember as a teenager, witnessed a lot of evangelism, a lot of baptisms. Maybe you don't do it in this church, but where I grew up in the mountains of West Virginia, we had a lot of rededication. I rededicated so much, my rededicator wore out, amen. <laughs> and a lot of church membership. But however, I never heard the term discipleship. I, like so many others, struggle with my salvation. It wasn't because I didn't want to know, it was because I just didn't know. And I didn't know for certain that if I die, I would go to heaven. And to complicate all of that, a preacher's granddaughter came to me and told me that she said with her grandfather the last few minutes on this earth, she said, he said this to her, Honey, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I'm going to heaven. Is there something I missed? Is there something I failed to do? When I heard that, I prayed to myself and I said, Dear Lord, I do not want to die with that kind of doubt in my heart. I wonder, is there anyone here today that you have that gnawing with inside of you, a sense of insecurity, Deep within your heart, you're saying, I really want to know when I die that I'm going to heaven. If you've ever faced a close death experience, you will immediately 
with intensity, realize there's one thing more important than anything in this world, and that's your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. A near-death experience that I had a couple of years ago set me on a course to understand, without a doubt, with no shadow of a doubt whatsoever, that I can know within my heart with full security, with full assurance, that when I die, I will be with Jesus Christ. First John gives us a five-fold argument for the assurance of our salvation. And every time John uses the word new birth, he gives us kind of like a test or an evidence that we can say that, yes, we do have eternal life. So let's take this exam this morning. If we're truly a child of God, we can find out that we do have the new birth. Notice this that 2 Corinthians 13, 5 said, Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove yourselves. Know you not in your own selves that how that Jesus Christ is in you except you be reprobates. I like to read it a different way. It says this, examine yourselves as whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. So with that in mind, the Bible says, examine myself. So number one, I want you to look with me at 1 John chapter 5, verse 1, is our first exam. It says this, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him, that begotteth him, also is begotten of him. First thing is faith. The first evidence is this, and it may seem slight to you, but I want you to listen to me that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Let me take it a step further. Is he your Messiah? Brother Larry, what do you mean? When Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? As we go through the story, Peter stands and says, thou art the Christos. Thou art the Messiah. Thou art the anointed one that has been promised by the prophets from ages to come that would be God in flesh, that would live us, that would live among us and redeem us and would take this world, sit on David's, Father David's throne and rule the earth for a thousand years and take all the wrong and set it right. Man, I don't know about you. I listened last night to Hallelujah Chorus. As I listen to that, if you're, if you're a believer and you don't cry, something's wrong with you, honey. Because I'm going to tell you, as they sing, and every time each octave it goes up, they speak about Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords, King of kings, Lord of lords, and all that, and all I can think about, Brother Mike, I can, when I stand before him, all we can do is kneel down with our faces toward the ground, lifting our hand and praising, Thou art worthy, Thou art worthy, Thou art worthy, with tears streaming down our face to the glory of God. Is he your Messiah? You cannot be a Christian without faith. But not just any faith. What do you mean, Brother Larry? Well, Mother Skunk has her little babies, and she is walking across the railroad track. All of a sudden, a train is coming down the track. She moves in front of that train, turns around, and throws up that tail and squirts it out. She has faith to believe that her perfume will turn that train around. But in her faith, she's going to die. Listen to me. The object of your faith is more important than faith itself. Where do you get that at? Glad you asked. The Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. My friend, if you just have faith in something but not in Jesus Christ, it is not saving faith. And not only to that, but you must believe if you're a Christian that Jesus Christ came in flesh, born of Mary in Bethlehem, and he was God in flesh, the Son of God. And 1 John 4, 2 says this, Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Now hold on a moment. Why in the world does John address the subject so much in his epistle here about Jesus being God in flesh? Well, you've got to understand a little bit of history. During that day in the Mideast, there was a philosophy that was going around and it was infiltrating the church. It was called 
Gnosticism. Now, it may be a big word for you, but listen to me. Gnosticism said this, the material, stu- the material evidence of the universe, all is sin. Flesh is sin. Material is sin. Everything is sin. And because a human body is sin, therefore God could not be in human form. And Jesus, therefore, was not incarnated. John says, you are lying. God in flesh was Jesus Christ. And those that deny that he was God in flesh are the Antichrist. It is important to believe that Jesus lived among us in a literal body, a body without sin. He did not become into existence in Bethlehem. He was living before. He literally came in the form of man to live among us. And so, therefore, he lived with us. He died for our sins. He was resurrected for our justification. He ascended on the third day. He seated at the right hand of the Father as a place of completion and authority. That, my friend, is the first. Let me move on. I'm going to leave my notes and go speaking differently. Second point is, so number one, do you have faith that Jesus is the Son of God lived in flesh? I remember it. I don't know if Brother Mike and Sister Karen have had the joy of going to the Holy Land, but I remember, and I've been there a few times, and I remember standing at the Holy of Holies, what we believe is the Holy of Holies. It's a copula that is right there, and it's facing right in behind the Golden Gate, looking straight through it like this. You look, and you see the Kitron Valley, and you see the Mount of Olives. I cried like a baby. I thought, my God, ascended from that mount, and my God is coming back to that mount. He's my God. I can't comprehend how God became flesh, but my friends, I believe it with every fiber of my being. So number one, have faith. Number two, we're going to get where the rubber meets the road now, a changed life. Look at 1 John chapter 2 and verse 29. We're going to stay right here close. Verse 29, chapter 2. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of God. When Jesus truly saved us, it makes a difference how we think. It makes a difference how we act. It makes a difference in how we speak. It makes a difference in our conduct. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. If we only talk about righteousness and not living righteous, then we're lying. The Chinese says it's all talky-talky and no walkie-walkie. An illustration watched me was a missionary to China. He had been in the mountains around Fuzhou, and he led an elderly Chinese man to the Lord. And the man loved to drink wine before his meals. Winter was coming, and he had to leave because once winter set in, he couldn't get out of there. So he went back down to the valley of Fuzhou, and to the city of Fuzhou, and he lived there. And the entire winter, he worried about the old man. I never had time to teach him, never had time to spend time to disciple him. And Nee worried about him, worried about him, worried about him. And finally, spring came, and Nee went back up and saw the old man. And finally, the subject came around, and he said, said, Sir, what did you do at mule time when you would normally take your glass of wine and drink it? Listen to what the old Chinese said. When I put the glass of wine in my hands to my lips, new resident boss in me said no to wine. I want to ask you, the new resident boss in you when you get ready to do what you used to do, the way you used to talk, the way you used to act, the language you used to do, your conduct, the places you used to go, does the new resident boss live within you say no? Because God the Spirit, at the moment of your conversion, came and lives within you. He guides you. He teaches you. He will convict you of sin and of righteousness. And friend, if you say that you're a believer and your talk hasn't changed and your walk hasn't changed and your conduct hasn't changed, I'm wondering if you've ever really been born again. 
A friend of mine who has recently died is Leonard Kells. Leonard Kells is one of the most authentic Christians that I have ever met in my life. Leonard Kells, before he got saved, he was mean as the devil. He was so mean to his wife that she divorced him. He was a bootlegger, and he lived up the holler from where I grew up at. You see, where I grew up at, corn didn't come out of the holler in solid form. It came out in liquid form. <laughs> Leonard got saved. Man, all of a sudden, his countenance changed. He had a smile upon his face. And everywhere you saw Leonard, and Leonard would let you know without a doubt that God changed his life. He loved Jesus, and he loved God, and he would tell any and everybody about that. And here's what people said about Leonard that knew him. People that knew Leonard Kells said this, Leonard Kells is a changed man. May I ask this about you? What are others saying about you? Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved, and not, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. But verse 10 continues, Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. When we meet Christ, all of a sudden, repentance is a simple thing, really. It means I'm going this direction, then all of a sudden, I turn 180 degrees and go completely in a different direction. Listen to me. My friends, Octagon Soap and all of those whoopings that my mama gave never took the cursing out of my mouth. But when I met Jesus Christ with one glorious swoop, he cleaned up my mouth. Hallelujah. My brothers like to bring up to me one in particular my past. I finally got all I could take one day. And I looked at him and said, Bill, can I ask you a question? Yes. Has my life changed? He's hung his head and said, yep. I said, case settled. And I walked away. So we have faith. We have a changed life. But let me ask you something else. Do you love people? 1 John 4, 7 says it like this. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. The word love occurs 26 times in this epistle. John says, the one who loves like God, loves God. There's a progression in this chapter. Notice in verse 7, if you have your Bibles. Notice it says, verse 7, love is of God. Look at verse 8. God is love. Look at verse 10. This is love that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Skip down to verse 19. We loved him because he first loved us. And then he cultivates it all back up again in verse 11. He says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Anyone who says there's a Christian and who doesn't love their Christian brothers and sisters there is a problem with the inconsistency of your life. Some are saying, Brother Larry, not everybody in the family of God is easy to love. And I want you to know that I'm going to say, Amen. Hallelujah. If you don't know that, become a Baptist pastor and you'll find out real quickly. Right, Brother Mike? <laughs> what are you laughing about? <laughs> a dear sister... Got convicted. She didn't love Susie. In fact, she didn't like Susie. She didn't like being around Susie. So she prayed, Dear Lord, I love Susie. She's going to try the positive mental attitude. Dear Lord, I love Susie. She stopped in the middle of her prayer, cried out, Dear God, I don't love Susie, and you know it. <laughs> Lord, would you love Susie through me? And in the process of time, God loving through her Susie, it rubbed off on her, and she began to love Susie. A friend of mine named Dr. Doug Barber just retired from pastor after many, many years. He said, Brother Larry and Danville, we had this lady that came to our church one Sunday, and I won't tell her name, but said that she was not a very attractive-looking lady. He said, in fact, she came to me and bragged on the fact that that she was voted, that she won in the State Fair of West Virginia, the ugliest woman in West Virginia. He said, Brother Larry, she was ugly. And said, she not only that, said she talked funny also. 
and said, not only that, she smelled funny as well. And said she would come to church and said, like a skunk, people just, nobody sit around her and whatever. But she would always call me on Monday morning, Brother Doug, this is Sister So-and-so. I want you to know that I've been praying for you today. Brother Doug, I love you, and I'm praying God will use you. But hang up. She did this every Monday morning for year in and year out. And Doug said, you know what? It came just all of a sudden, I noticed, and I looked at her, she wasn't as ugly as she used to be. Said, you know, said her, her uh, clamp, uh, kind of talk that she had, her slang that she had, he said, it wouldn't sound so bad. And said, you know what? He said, in fact, Brother Larry, I came where I looked forward to those phone calls every Monday, and I came to where I loved her, and she died. And when I preached her funeral, he said, I cried like a baby. When you know God, and God lives within your life, the outward appearance of a person does not determine whether you love them or you love them not. The inner person within each one of us, created in the image of God, is lovable. You may have a hard time right now praying for the Russian soldiers, but I pray for them. Many of them are inscripted. They don't want to be there. They've been lied to. They told they were going to a training camp. Instead, they put them on the front lines. Those men need to be saved. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. It's hard to love people who hurt you. Romans 12, 18 said, Paul said, if it be possible as much life lies to me, be peaceful with all men. You know what Paul was saying? Paul said, I'm going to do everything on my behalf to be at peace with every man. And if we can be, then it's not going to be my fault. So we've talked about a change. We talk about faith. We talk about changed life. We talk about loving. But I want to now even tighten the noose up a little bit tighter. Look in 1 John 5, 4. For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. What would you think if you entered a church and seen it filled with grown people wearing nothing but baby diapers? I don't mean the pins, but I mean baby diapers. I don't know about you, but I'd get up and leave real quickly. Amen. Many professing Christians never grow spiritually resulting in spiritual stagnation and spiritual immaturity. Paul addressed, well, we're not sure who wrote Hebrews, but Hebrews 5 says it like this, and I'm going to paraphrase in Larry, Larry's way. He said, by this time, you ought to be teachers. But he says, you know what? Someone's having to teach you again the very first ABCs about Christian faith. It says it's time that you should be on solid food, but I'm still having to give you a bottle with milk in it. He says milk is unskilled in the words of righteousness. It's for a baby, but solid food belongs to those who are full of age, those who by reason of use, in other words, have exercised to discern good and evil. Friends, listen, we need to grow up. John says, you're an overcomer. What does it mean? It means that I'm not allowing the world to put me in its mold and make me like the world. That means that I stand up against the world system. I don't have to do what the world does. The victory that overcomes the world, he says, is our faith. We begin rising above the temptations. We begin rising above the peer pressure. And some of you are saying, but Brother Larry, you don't know. You don't understand what I go through. And you're right, I don't. But I know one thing. I've got a God that is greater than anything that you and I face. Amen. Every Christian should get to a point in their life, listen to this, where the things that used to bother you, you struggled with, your temptations with them, you're no longer there. You have overcome them. You've grown beyond them. And if you've been saved for 10 years, 20 years, 30, 40, 50 years, and you're still struggling like the day you got saved, pardon me, but you're still a baby and you need a bottle. Amen. Ouch, oh me. I asked myself, 
Where am I today spiritually compared to where I was a year ago? I don't have anyone to blame but Larry. Listen, when I gain weight, it's because of that right hand right there. I'm the one putting it in here. B's not putting it in here. You're not putting it in here. It's me. And spiritually, when I'm not growing, I'm not spending time in this word and on my knees. I am, will be 71 years of age in about six weeks, and I want you to know something. I have realized that I don't know very much about the Bible, but I sure want to learn, and I'm looking forward to sitting at the master's feet and let him teach me or getting to sit before some of the great theologians that's lived on this earth and allow them to teach me during the kingdom age. Amen. How are you growing today? Where are your maturity at? Are you more strong today than you were a year ago? And finally, in verse 18, he says this. 1 John 5, 18 says, We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Now, folks, this seems to be very complicated, but I think I can explain it. He says, For we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that belongeth of God keepeth himself, that the wicked one toucheth him not. John repeats this very, very important principle. No one who has been transformed by the new birth does not go on continually living a life of sin. Now listen to this. John is talking about an ongoing, conscious, intentional practice of sin. A contempt to God's moral law. A contempt to God's word. An open rebellion. It's a pattern of a person's lifestyle. And if that's the pattern of your lifestyle, you've never been born again. In contrast to this, Paul says that a person who is a child of God, they cease to be a rebellious person. Romans 6, 14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you. You know what he's saying? Jesus broke the power of sin upon your life. Before I got saved, that's who I was. I was a sinner, and I was living it to the fullest. But when I came to Jesus Christ, that power controlling authority over me has been broken. And now because God lives within you, you can say no to the power of sin. Brother Larry, does that mean when we as believers sin that we're no longer saved? No, no, no. does not mean that. If we're truly saved, when we sin, we grieve over our sins. We agree with God says. We get down on our knees and say, oh, God, I am so sorry. I am brokenhearted, God. I have sinned against you. Lord, this is a vile thing in your sight. God, forgive me. Thank you in Jesus' name that your blood cleanses us. And, Lord, help me by your grace never to do that again. That's what 1 John 1, 9 says. Now, 1 John 3, 9 says, Whosoever is born of God do not commit sin. Now, Larry, can you explain that? With what little bit I know, I will try. It's John is using, listen to this, the present verb tense when he talks about sinning. You know what it means? It means it is not a continual action in your life. You hear the person talking every other word is a curse word. I want to tell you that's a continual action. That's evidence that life hasn't changed. A slip. I remember a lady who was 78 years old, led to the Lord in Northern Virginia. Her name was Tommy. Tommy Cullen. Tommy gloriously got saved. She was sitting in my office one day. She had no idea, but she let a big one slip. She's 78. She's been talking like that for 78 years, folks. She got saved. That was her way of life. She didn't continually talk like that. It was a slip of the tongue. She had no idea that she said it. That's what he's talking about. So finally, it's 12 o'clock. I've got to finish. Baptist time for chicken. You know what a preacher's belt buckle is? You got a belt buckle, Mike? It's a chicken's gravestone. Somebody said he likes the breast, the rest, and all the neck, the breast, and all the rest. I have to say amen. As a believer, you can choose to willfully sin 
And when you do, you are backslidden. Now, I want you to listen to this. If it's truly born of God, you will be miserable in that condition. If you sin and live a life of sin and it doesn't bother you, then, friend, your life has never been changed. If you belong to God, when you sin and you backslide, you will be miserable. And if not, it's evidence that you were never a Christian to begin with. John now has given us five evidences we could close. Number one, do you have faith? Do you really believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God? Number two, has your life changed? If nothing else, has your life changed? Number three, do you love being around Christians and fellowship with them? I don't know about you everywhere I've been and where Brother Mike and I have been together in Lithuania. We've met Russians, Lithuanians, Pol Polish people and others. And you know what? We don't speak the language, but there's something about the love of God that shares between me and those brothers and sisters that, friend, cannot be explained other than the fact this is God in me, the same God in them. Amen. Are you growing in your Christian life? Where are you at today compared to a year ago, two years ago? And number five, what about sin? Do you really get convicted or you're miserable when you sin? If you don't, then you need to check up. Maybe you're like Dr. Albert Einstein. I know who I am. The problem is I don't know where I'm going. And if that's true, then let me give you a final note right here. There is also something called false assurance. False assurance is saying, oh, yeah, I've done this, and everything's fine. Maybe you just repeated a prayer. It wasn't your prayer. You just repeated it because somebody said, pray for me. Or maybe you followed someone down the aisle, as my wife did when she was a six-year-old girl in vacation Bible school in Benton, Virginia. She had no more idea what she was doing than, than anything. Maybe as a very young child, you just said yes to Jesus because your parents told you you needed Jesus. Or as an adult, you felt pressure to make a decision. People were all times just saying, come on now, and they're in your home visiting, and it's 9 o'clock, and they wouldn't leave, and it's the only way you know you can get them to leave. You can say, yeah, I got saved. Or maybe you joined a church. All of these are false assumptions. If there's a continual gnawing of uneasiness in your heart that you're not at peace with God, and you're not sure when you die you'll go to heaven, it's time to get that settled right now, this morning, Right here, right now, this is the place, this is the hour, this is the time. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your rich word. And thank you, Father, that you can give us evidence. Lord, I wished as a teenage boy that somebody would have shared some simple truths like this with me. Lord, to help me that I could look into the Bible, not what the preacher said, not what the soul winner said. Lord, what does your word say? And Father, I thank you that I have gone over your word, I've read it, I've prayed over it, and I've realized, Father, these are the things that if a man believes that God has raised Jesus from the dead, confess in your heart that you've raised us from the dead, truly repented of our sins, and believe that Jesus died for our sins and he was buried, and he rose the third day for our justification, then, Lord, we know that we're saved. Thank you, Father, for the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. He convicts sinner and saint alike, those who need Christ, and those, Father, whose life is where it's not at right now and needs a change. I pray for your marvelous grace this morning, Father, that, Lord, we would have grace enough and gumption enough, Father, to say, you're right, Lord. It's time that I get this settled in my life, that I can know for sure that when I die, I will be with you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Pastor. As we all stand, as we all stand, well, you've heard the message this morning. What will you do with that message? More importantly, what will you do with the one that the message was about, which is Christ? Who's living within your heart today? Is God dealing with you this morning? If you walk out those doors, you have no one else to blame but yourself. Is there one here this morning? Maybe you're here this morning in need of whatever it might be in your life. Meet me here at Old Fashioned Altar. Let's pray about it. Give it all to the Lord before you go out those doors today.
And all of God's children said, Amen. ain't it good to be back in God's house today? Amen. I appreciate each and every one coming out this morning. Brother Larry, I thank you for that message. I look forward to the message tonight. Remember, choir practice at 5 o'clock. After service tonight, cake and ice cream for all the March birthdays. Anything else before we close? All hearts clear. Always remember that I love you, but even more importantly, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ loves you. Amen. 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 With that said, I'm going to ask Brother Wayne Wilmot if you would close us in prayer.